We have a number of special guests who have joined us this evening, including University of Nebraska President Milliken and Lincoln Mayor Colleen Tseng. Please join me in welcoming them. This event could not have occurred without significant collaboration with a number of entities both on and off campus. You'll see the list in the printed program. I particularly thank representatives from the Lincoln City Libraries and others representing the city of Lincoln. I thank the staff of the Lead Center for Performing Arts for their gracious work this evening, and also thank and recognize individuals from the University of Nebraska Press, including its new director, Gary Dunham. I also recognize the UNL Research Council, under whose auspices the Nebraska lectures occur, and also will thank Connie Herndon and Laura Lee Waldron, who will serve as our sign language interpreters tonight. Lincoln Mayor Colleen Seng has a special presentation to make to Ted. Mayor Seng. Thank you. As Mayor of Lincoln, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here this evening to celebrate Ted Kuzer and his poetry. Ted has received many other major awards and he has had many fans outside of the Great Plains for years. But many of us have enjoyed thinking that Ted is our secret treasure. Now the secret is out. Now it's time to share this treasure with the world. And the best part of the deal is that we continue to have a U.S. Poet Laureate in our world. Ted, we know you don't prefer the spotlight, but in your own quiet way, you are making a major impact on many. Imagine the impact it makes on a Lincoln third grader to have a visit from the first U.S. Poet Laureate from the Great Plains. How many adults will decide to explore poetry for the first time in their lives? How many children and adults will be inspired to create their own masterpieces in poetry, art, or theater? Imagine the impact that this national recognition will have on those who mistakenly think that our university has nothing but football and our state has nothing but cows and corn. Consider this remark from a from Bethesda, Maryland woman who was quoted in the Lincoln Journal Star after hearing Ted read his poetry in Washington, D.C. Between Warren Buffett and Ted Kuzer, Nebraska has everything. Yes, we certainly keep good company right here in Nebraska. Ted, whether you like it or not, there are many who consider you a hero. Your family, your friends, your colleagues, your community, your state, and your fans are very proud of you and this great honor. We wish you well on your mission to promote poetry to new audiences. You are definitely the right person for the job. And thank you for sharing this very special evening with all of us. Ted, you have to come over here a little bit closer to me now. I would like to uh, add to your growing list of accolades. This is the highest honor that I can bestow as mayor of the city of Lincoln. And it's truly a pleasure to present you with a key to the city of Lincoln. Now I have to read this too. Now, for those of you that have never been around when a key has been presented, there is a proclamation that goes with the key. So I'd like to read this for you. Ted Kuzer does hereby receive the key to the city. By proclamation of the mayor, you are hereby given a key to the city of Lincoln, and therefore you are entitled to all the rights, the privileges, and honors pertaining hereto. And I have signed it. 
Now, I have to tell you, though, we can't figure out what those rights and privileges mean. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Mayor Singh. Um, I have lived in this area now for over 40 years, and I don't know how I got along without this all those years. So um, I'm glad to have it. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to formally introduce Ted Kuchar. Ted earned a master's degree in 1968 from the University of Nebraska and has been a member of our English faculty since 1988. A native Iowan, he earned his bachelor's degree from Iowa State University. He enjoyed a 35-year-long career in the insurance industry here in Lincoln, retiring in 1999. During that career, Ted always found time to pursue his passion for writing and poetry. We all are the benefit of that passion. He is the author of 10 collections of poetry and two prose books. The latter, Local Wonders, and the just-released Poetry Home Repair Manual were published by the University of Nebraska Press. With respect to the repair manual, Ted has recently quoted as saying, he did not read the reviews, but preferred to live in blissful ignorance of what others were saying of him. Words we would expect from Ted, but brave words from the husband of the editor of the Lincoln Journal Star. <laughs> Among his many awards and honors are two National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, the Pushcart Prize, the Stanley Kunitz Prize, the James Boatwright Prize, a Merit Award from the Nebraska Arts Council, and a Mayor's Art Award from the City of Lincoln. And of course, the honor of serving as 13th Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress. These are just a sampling of his honors. I suspect, however, that Ted is more likely to receive personal satisfaction not from the honors, but from knowing that thousands of people have been inspired by his poetry and from knowing that through his efforts, he was able to take a palette of words residing in alien juxtaposition with one another and to rearrange them so that they brought fresh insight and perspective to the world in which we live. I'm very honored to present to you Ted Kuchar. I want to repeat a little story that I told at the graduation exercises in December. Uh, some of you know this story, but it, it's, um, it's my favorite story about being Poet Laureate. Um, Tom McCowan, who uh, grew up in Lincoln, lives in Los Angeles now, and uh, Tom was a student of mine many years ago. And after the articles began coming out about me, the, there was an article in the LA Times, and in that article there was a small mugshot of me and Tom was showing a six-year-old boy the article saying that he knew this man and talking about what the Poet Laureate did and what the Poet Laureate might do and this and that and the other. And when he got to the end, he said, so what do you think? And the little boy said, he looks like a hobbit. <laughs> Which, uh, and, and then went on to say, like he came from Middle Earth. And, I, and, and here we are in Middle Earth. You know, isn't that wonderful? Um, this has, been a, this has been wonderful for me, and, and I'm, I'm very grateful to the university for putting this event together tonight. It's great fun for me to have all you people here um, listening to me. Uh, readers are more important to me than anything else. Uh, publications and honors are nice, but uh, the idea that there are people actually out there reading your work is really a, a wonderful thing. Um, I've had the feeling all through this, uh, I, I, I said publicly that... Um, when it happened to me, I began thinking of all the reasons that it shouldn't have happened to me, uh, you know, in a typical Midwestern fashion. And right now, as I stand here sort of looking out into this sea of faces, I can just imagine that at any moment a huge foot will come down from above and just smash me flat, you know. Um, I often start my readings with this poem. It, it describes the uh, uh, sort of the state of contemporary poetry, I guess. It's called Selecting a Reader. First, I would have her be beautiful, 
and walking carefully up on my poetry at the loneliest moment of an afternoon, her hair still damp at the neck from washing it. She should be wearing a raincoat, an old one, dirty from not having money enough for the cleaners. She will take out her glasses, and there in the bookstore, she will thumb over my poems, then put the book back up on its shelf. She will say to herself, for that kind of money, I can get my raincoat cleaned, and she will. I'm fighting off a little head cold, so if I'm snuffling up here, please forgive me. Uh, this next poem describes the, the little farm where my wife and I live. We, we're about 20 miles from Lincoln, north and west, uh, north of Garland, a couple of miles, straight west of Branched Oak Lake, in late spring. One of the National Guard's F-4 jet fighters making a long approach to the Lincoln airfield comes howling in over the treetops, its shadow flapping along behind it like the skin of a sheep, setting the coyotes crying back in the woods, and then the dogs, and then there is a sudden quiet that rings a little, the way an empty pan rings when you wipe it dry. And then it is Sunday again, a summer Sunday afternoon, and beyond my window the Russian olives sigh foolishly into the air through the throats of their flowers, and bluegills nibble the clouds afloat on the pond. Under the windmill a cluster of peonies huddles, bald-headed now, and standing in piles of old papers. Beneath its lipstick the mouth of the tulip is twisted. Spring moves on on her run-down broken toe shoes into the summer, trailing green ribbons of silk. I have been reading for hours, or intending to read, but over the bee song of the book I could faintly hear my neighbor up the road a quarter mile calling out to his daughter, and hear her calling back, not in words, but in musical notes. And now that they have fallen quiet, and I have listened long into their absence, I have forgotten my place in the world. But the world knows my place and stands and holds a chair for me here on these acres near Garland, Nebraska. This April, in good health, I entered my 65th year. The perfect porcelain bells of Lily of the Valley ring into the long, shy ears of the ferns, and the horsefly sits in the sun and twirls his mustache and brushes the dust from his satin sleeves. Um, this next group of poems is about people I've seen here and there. They're sort of little portraits. <laughs> tattoo. This is about, uh, you know what tattoos look like when they get old, and uh, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of brand new tattoos these days, and so this, is, this poem serves as a sort of warning, I think. Uh, <laughs> tattoo. What once was meant to be a statement, a dripping dagger held in the fist of a shuddering heart, is now just a bruise on a bony old shoulder. The spot where vanity once punched him hard and the ache lingered on. He looks like someone you had to reckon with, strong as a stallion, fast and ornery. But on this chilly morning as he walks between the tables at a yard sale, with the sleeves of his tight black t-shirt rolled up to show us who he was, he is only another old man, picking up broken tools and putting them back, his heart gone soft and blue with stories. Here's, thank you. This is another one. This is a, this is a woman I saw um, in, the, um, in the grocery store parking lot, a rainy morning. A young woman in a wheelchair, wearing a black nylon poncho spattered with rain, is pushing herself through the morning. You have seen how pianists sometimes bend forward to strike the keys, then lift their hands, draw back to rest, then lean again to strike just as the chord fades. Such is the way this woman strikes at the wheels, then lifts her long white fingers, letting them float then bends again to strike just as the chair slows as if into a silence. So expertly she plays the chords of this difficult music she has mastered, her wet face beautiful in its concentration while the wind turns the pages of rain. This next one, um, 
Back in the um, 60s and 70s, when people had really long, straight hair, you know, you, you'll remember that they walked like this. Well, well now, now young people with backpacks, when they walk, they do this with their hands, I've noticed. They sort of, they're kind of paddling ahead. And I, I saw this young man on campus with a green backpack on, and, and he looked exactly to me like a, a sea turtle lumbering up upon a, onto a beach, paddling his way up ahead. So this is a little portrait of a student. The green shell of his backpack makes him lean into wave after wave of responsibility, and he swings his stiff arms and cupped hands paddling ahead. He has extended his neck to its full length, and his chin, hard as a beak, breaks the cold surf. He's got his baseball cap on backward as up he crawls out of the froth of a hangover and onto the sand of the future, and lumbers, heavy with hope, into the library. <laughs> I've written Valentine poems for, this is the 19th year, and uh, this is last year's Valentine. Again, the observation of a, looking at a couple of people I saw. Splitting an order. I like to watch an old man cutting a sandwich in half. Maybe an ordinary cold roast beef on whole wheat bread, no pickles or onion keeping his shaky hands steady by placing his forearms firm on the edge of the table and using both hands, the left to hold the sandwich in place and the right to cut it surely corner to corner, observing his progress through glasses that moments before he wiped with his napkin, and then to see him lift half onto the extra plate that he asked the server to bring, and then to wait, offering the plate to his wife while she slowly unrolls her napkin and places her spoon, her knife, and her fork in their proper places, then smooths the starched white napkin over her knees and meets his eyes and holds out both old hands to him. Thank you. This one, um, this one came out of watching um, Jim Flowers on the weather news, um, standing with the with the map and making this motion as he talked to the you know the it's it's called Weather Central. Each evening at 6:15, the weatherman turns a shoulder to us, extends his hand, and talking softly as a groom, cautiously smooths and strokes the massive dappled flank of the continent touching the cloudy whirls that drift like galaxies across its hide, tracing the loops of harness with their barbs and bells and pennants. Then, with a horsefly's touch, he brushes a mountain range and sets a shutter running just under the skin. His bearing is cavalier from years of success, and he laughs at the science, yet makes no sudden moves that might startle that splendid order or loosen the physics. One would not want to wake the enormous Appaloosa mare of weather asleep in her stall on a peaceful moonlit night. And here's a figure skater again. I'm, I'm very interested in these um, things that happen in life that happen in, in an instant. And in this poem, there is a one flourish that the figure skater makes that really was what I was trying to capture in the whole poem, Skater. She was all in black, but for a yellow ponytail that trailed from her cap, and bright blue gloves that she held out wide, the feathery fingers spread, as surely she stepped click-clack onto the frozen top of the world. And there, with a clatter of blades, she began to braid a loose path that broadened into a meadow of curls. Across the ice she swooped and then turned back and halfway bent her legs and leapt into the air the way a crane leaps, blue gloves lifting her lightly, and turned a snappy half turn there in the wind before coming down, arms wide, skating backward right out of that moment, smiling back at the woman she'd been just an instant before.
and another of those um, at the cancer clinic. She is being helped toward the open door that leads to the examining rooms by two young women I take to be her sisters. Each bends to the weight of an arm and steps with the straight, tough bearing of courage. At what must seem to be a great distance, a nurse holds the door, smiling and calling encouragement. How patient she is in the crisp white sails of her clothes. The sick woman peers from under her funny knit cap to watch each foot swing, scuffing forward, and take its turn under her weight. There is no restlessness or impatience or anger anywhere in sight. Grace fills the clean mold of this moment, and all the shuffling magazines grow still. Thank you. This is another one of those poems about something just in, happens in a very in a very in a split second, really. And I would guess that most of you have had this experience. It's called in passing. From a half block off, I see you coming, walking briskly along, carrying parcels, furtively glancing up into the faces of people approaching, looking for someone you know, holding your smile in your mouth like a pebble, keeping it moist and ready, being careful not to swallow. I know that hope so open on your face, know how your heart would lift to see just one among us who remembered. If only someone would call out your name, would smile, so happy to see you again. You shift your heavy parcels, hunch up your shoulders, and press ahead into the moment. From a few feet away, you recognize me, or think you do. I see you preparing your face, getting your greeting ready. Do I know you? Both of us wonder. Swiftly, we meet and pass, averting our eyes. Close enough to touch, but not touching. I could not let you know that I've forgotten, and yet you know. This next little group is about uh, our poems about things. Um, uh, my teacher and mentor, Carl Shapiro, who was here in Nebraska when I first came, uh, was a great poet of things and taught me a great deal about writing about things. And what I've tried to do is to pick very ordinary things and work with those. Um, and this one is about a spiral notebook. The bright wire rolls like a porpoise in and out of the calm blue sea of the cover. Or perhaps like a sleeper twisting in and out of his dreams, for it could hold a record of dreams if you wanted to buy it for that. Though it seems to be meant for more serious work with its college-ruled lines and its cover that states in emphatic white letters, five subject notebook. It seems a part of growing old is no longer to have five subjects, e each demanding an equal share of attention set apart by brown cardboard dividers, but instead to stand in a drugstore and hang on to one subject a little too long. <laughs> Like this notebook, you weigh in your hands, passing your fingers over its surfaces as if it were some kind of wonder. Um, David Quammen is a, a writes a natural history essay. He's a very fine writer, and in one of them, he described a moth that lives on tears. Uh, no poet could resist that subject, um, and this is the this is the poem. And the title of the poem is the species name of this moth, Lobocraspus grisifusa. <laughs> this is the tiny moth who lives on tears, who drinks like a deer at the gleaming pool at the edge of the sleeper's eye. The touch of its mouth is light as a cloud's reflection. In your dream, a moonlit figure appears at your bedside and touches your face. He asks if he might share the poor bread of your sorrow. You show him the table. The two of you talk long into the night, but by morning the words are forgotten. You awaken serene in a sunny room, rubbing the dust of his wings from your eyes. And this one... This one, um, I was a smoker for a good long time, and um, 
I was always, I, I think I, one of the things that lured me into smoking was watching people blow smoke rings. And I, um, this is a fairly recent poem um, about, the, about that activity. I don't know whether people do it or not anymore. You know, uh, smoking has become such a, a, a thing to hide, you know, that people don't celebrate it by blowing smoke rings, I guess. Smoke rings. Those silent exclamations, those soft O's that puffed out one after another, and then, like rubber bands peeled from the end of the morning paper, gave up their shape and floated slack and twisted into the future. Those were the next to the last grand gestures of the pleasures of smoking. Before each cigarette became such serious business, such a bitter pill. And the grand finale, that one big ring, puffed out, and quickly, a smaller ring blown rolling through it, and then through that one, all those years. A sound in the night. There's a clock at the end of the pasture, talking and talking. It's my neighbor's new electric fencer, a red tin box with a steady pulse. On a night like this, chilly and still, you can hear it knock for a hundred yards, counting the stars with its bony knuckle, a sound absurd against the darkness. But many of us have stopped in our places to listen. A mouse with a globe of dew in her paws, a coyote lifting his head from the grass, his wet tail tipped with starlight. Even my father, dead these many years, has heard the flat, remorseless counting and reaches out into the darkness and over the years for my mother's hand. This is... Thank you. Um, I would guess that many of you have, have uh, at some time in your lives, tried to drink hot coffee out of a glass cup uh, it stays hot for about five seconds and then gets cold rather quickly. And, and this little poem about depres depression glass, uh, for those younger people in the audience, depression glass was, was given out at grocery stores. It's, at, it, it's a transparent glass in pastel colors. Uh, my grandmother had a set, and um, you got a piece. When you, when you made a purchase, you, you got a cup or a saucer or so on. Depression glass. It seemed those rose pink dishes she kept for special company were always cold, brought down from the shelf in jingling stacks, the plates like the panes of ice she broke from the water bucket winter mornings, the flaring cups like tulips that opened too early and got bitten by frost. They chilled the coffee no matter how quickly you drank, while a heavy everyday mug would have kept a splash hot for the better part of a conversation. It was hard to hold up your end of the gossip with your coffee cold. But, but it was a special occasion just the same to sit at her kitchen table and sip the bitter percolation of the past week's rumors from cups it had taken a year to collect at the grocery with one piece free for each five pounds of flour. This, this next poem is an experience that everyone in this room has shared. Um, I, I always have a, I, I love to read this poem, it's so much fun. The Urine Specimen. <laughs> in the clinic, a sun-bleached shell of stone on the shore of the city, you enter the last small chamber, chastened, a little closet chastened with pearl cool, white, and glistening, and over the chilly well of the toilet you trickle your precious sum in a cup. It's as simple as that. But the heat of this gold, your body's melted and poured out into a form, begins to enthrall you, warming your hand with your flesh's fevers in a terrible way. It's like holding an organ, spleen or fatty pancreas, a lobe from your foamy brain still steaming with worry. <laughs> you know that just outside, a nurse is waiting to cool it into a gel and slice it onto a microscope slide for the doctor, 
who in it will read your future wringing his hands. <laughs> you lift the chalice and toast the long life of your friend there in the mirror who wanly smiles but does not drink to you. <laughs> That was once, that was once uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Was really a... <laughs> My father um, told me that early in the 20th century, there, there were vendors who went from school to school, public schools, and they sold a portfolio of reproductions of great art. And it was the same portfolio always. It had uh, Malays, the Gleaners, it had the end of the trail, the Indian making a pot by the fire, the, um, that one with the wolf looking down into the snowy valley, uh, the, the Gilbert Stuart George Washington, the famous Lincoln, and so on. And I got to thinking that, that many of our perceptions of the world may have been shaped in some way by looking at these pictures day after day in schools. And I thought I'd try to write some poems about them. And this one is, the, is about the Gilbert Stuart portrait of Washington. This is the one, the, you know, the unfinished portrait that has the the uh, bare spot at the bottom. Um, also in this poem I might say that I, I rarely allude to something beyond the, r the edges of my poems, but I talk in here about um, his complexion and the fact that he had left a, uh, started some bonfires and then retreated behind them. That was something that Washington actually did as a military tactic, leave tactic left the fires burning as he retreated. The Gilbert Stuart Portrait of Washington. You know it as well as the back of your hand, that face like a blushing bouquet of pink peonies set in the shadows of war, the father of our country, patient, sucking the past from his wooden teeth. His famous portrait, never completed, hung on the wall at the front of the classroom next to a black octagonal clock with the ghost of a teacher trapped inside, tapping out time with a piece of chalk. It was easy to see his attention was elsewhere. He'd left a dozen campfires burning out there at the front of his face, then retreated behind them. At 58, he was old and broken. This was no way to use up the days of a soldier. Celebrity irked him. He had little time for the likes of Gilbert Stuart, that son of a snuff-grinding Tory, that slackered who'd sat out the war with the English. Perched on a chair in a cold stone barn, according to Stewart, he smiled only once when a stallion ran past. He cared more for thoroughbred horses and farming than he did for the presidency. On the wall between us and the future, at the point where all the lines converged, George Washington, like any other man, suppressed a deep sigh. So heavy was life, how futile it seemed to protest. We learned our lessons while the big clock clacked, its Roman numerals arranged in a wreath and sealed under glass. Those were lovely calico autumns, then winter passed with its long, clean penance of light, then spring with its chaffy rustle. We thought those aisles were parallel, that our days would never arrive at the vanishing point. Before us always, he who could never tell a lie kept his jaws closed on the truth. One of, the, um, one of the great pleasures of going around the country doing poetry readings is meeting the people that are out there, uh, some you know, marvelous, inventive, uh, wonderful poets and, and so on. Um, I was in Philadelphia a number of years ago at a small college and I gave a reading and I was invited uh, that evening after the reading to the home of an English professor and his wife. And uh, it turned out that she was the step-granddaughter of John Cornos. John Cornos was one of the Imagist poets who's all but forgotten today, but he knew them all. He knew all these people. And um, so after dinner, she said, I thought you might like to look through some of the things that he had. And she brought out this good-sized cardboard box full of of letters and mementos of one kind or another. There were letters from T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and William Butler Yeats's calling card and uh, all sorts of things like that. I mean, this whole box full of these original things. And I was completely stunned by, you know, just having my hands on them. And then 
she said, now, Ted, you're interested in painting, aren't you? You paint a little. And I said, yes. And she said, um, I want to show you this. And she brought out from the side room a wooden box, a flat wooden box, and put it on my knees, a box of pastels. I once held on my knees a simple wooden box in which a rainbow lay, dusty and broken. It was a set of pastels that had years before belonged to the painter Mary Cassatt, and all the colors she'd used in her work lay open before me. Those hues she'd most used, the peaches and pinks, were worn down to stubs, while the cool colors, violet, ultramarine, had been set scarcely touched to one side. She'd had little patience with darkness, and her heart held only a measure of shadow. I touched the warm dust of those colors, her tools, and left there with light on the tips of my fingers. <laughs> it was really something I... I write a lot of poems that are really built on a single metaphor, um, and I, I love playing around with the metaphor. And, and sometimes, sometimes you can take a rather ordinary object and make, really make something special out of it with, uh, by just simply working with metaphor. This one's uh, an example of that. It's called Telescope. This is the pipe that pierces the dam that holds back the universe that takes off some of the pressure, keeping the weight of the unknown from breaking through and washing us all down the valley. Because of this small tube through which a cold light rushes from the bottom of time, the depth of the stars stays always constant, and we are able to sleep, at least for now, beneath the straining wall of darkness. It's a telescope. Then there, are these, then there are these poems that really don't need any kind of uh, figurative language because the, the message they carry is so, has enough power in itself. And this is, this is an example of the other kind of poem. A deck of pornographic playing cards. We were 10 or 11, my friend and I, when we found them up under a bridge on top of a beam where pigeons were resting. Someone had carefully hidden them there. On each was a black and white photo, no two cards alike. We grew quiet and older. Young men on our haunches, staring at what we feared might be the future. <laughs> the pigeons flapped back to their roosts, rustling and cooing. The river gurgled as it slipped from the bridge's cool shadow. There were women with big muzzled dogs, women with bottles and broom handles. Stallions stood over the bodies of others. The women smiled and licked their lips with tongues like thorns. We grew old. We were two old men with stiff legs and sad hearts. We had wanted to laugh, but we couldn't. We had thought we were boys, come there to throw stones at the pigeons, but we were already dying inside. I don't know whether my friend Keith Jacob Sagan is here tonight or not, but this is a family story that Keith gave me and I tinkered with a little and transformed it a little. It's a, it's a straight narrative poem. Um, I think it's very much like a like an outline for a Willa Cather novel in a way. Um, it also has a sort of cinematic sense to it. I was very much taken with this story. The Beaded Purse. Dressed in his church suit and under the shadow of his hat, the old man stood on the wooden depot platform three feet above the rest of Kansas while the westbound freight chuffed in and hissed to a stop. He and the agent and two men, commercial travelers waiting to go on west, pulled mailbags out of the steam, then slid out his daughter's coffin, canvas over wood, and set it on a nearby baggage cart. Not till the train had rolled away and tooted once as it passed the shacks on the leading edge of the distance, and not till the agent had disappeared, dragging the bags of mail behind, did the old man pry up the nail-down lid with a bar he'd brought in the wagon. 
Hat in hand, he took a long look. He hadn't seen her in a dozen years. At 19, without his blessing, she'd gone back east to be an actress, now and then writing her mother in a carefree, ne'er-do-well cursive to say she was happy living in style. A week before, the agent sent word that there was a telegram waiting, and the old man and his wife rode the town to read that their daughter had died and her remains were on the way home. Remains, that's how they put it. She was wearing a fancy yellow dress but was no longer young and pretty. She looked like one of the worn-out dolls she'd left in her room at the farm where he would sometimes go to sit. A bag of women's private underthings had been stuffed between her feet and someone had pushed down next to her an evening bag beaded with pearls. He opened the purse and found it empty. So he took a few bills out of his pocket and folded them in then snapped it closed for her mother to find. Then, with the back of the bar, he tapped the lid in place and went to find the station agent. The two of them lifted the coffin down and carried it the few hard yards across the sunny, dusty floor of Kansas and loaded it onto the creaking wagon. Then, clapping his hat on his head and slapping the plump rump of his mare with the reins, he started the long haul home with his rich and famous daughter. Isn't that a marvelous story? <laughs> stories like that all over the Great Plains, wonderful stories. A few family poems here. This first one I wrote really to capture a name. My mother's uh, first cousin, Ira Friedlein, had a, that was his name, and it was such a beautiful name, and I loved this man. Um, and um, I went to see him in the nursing home shortly before he died, and he had developed, like a lot of old people, a very pronounced um, age spot, a very almost solid black, blue-black age spot on one hand that went up into his, the sleeve of his shirt. That's a part of the poem, too. It's called A Goodbye Handshake. Though you in the nursing home are miles behind me now, your hand with its dark blue age spots is here in my hand, your fingers warm from all the hot steel handles they held in your 88 years, levers of threshing machines, of sickle bar mowers and balers, but cooling now and slowly going all blue-black over brown, like a pool of blue oil on the floor of a barn, that darkness working its way up into the cuff of your new plaid shirt, up past your elbow, sharp as a plowshare there on the wheelchair armrest, easing over your heart like a shadow. A hundred miles down the road, stopped by the highway and sitting in shade at the edge of a shimmering cornfield, I say goodbye. I am headed both farther and further than you, Ira Friedlein. With love I take your blue-black hand, which has held nearly everything once and has squeezed it shyly and politely. And this one I wrote a month after my mother passed away in 1998. Mother. Mid-April already, and the wild plums bloom at the roadside, a lacy white against the exuberant, jubilant green of new grass and the dusty, fading black of burnt-out ditches. No leaves, not yet, only the delicate, star-petaled blossoms, sweet with their timeless perfume. You have been gone a month today and have missed three rains and one night-long watch for tornadoes. I sat in the cellar from six to eight while fat spring clouds went somersaulting, rumbling east. Then it poured, a storm that walked on legs of lightning, dragging its shaggy belly over the fields. The meadowlarks are back and the finches are turning from green to gold. Those same two geese have come to the pond again this year, honking in over the trees and splashing down. They never nest, but stay a week or two, then leave. The peonies are up, the red sprouts burning in circles like birthday candles, for this is the month of my birth, as you know, the best month to be born in, thanks to you, everything ready to burst with living. 
There will be no more new flannel nightshirts sewn on your old black singer, no birthday card addressed in a shaky but businesslike hand. You asked me if I would be sad when it happened, and I am sad. But the iris I moved from your house now hold in the dusty, dry fists of their roots green knives and forks as if waiting for dinner, as if spring were a feast. I thank you for that. Were it not for the way you taught me to look at the world, to see the life at play in everything, I would have to be lonely forever. Mother had another first cousin. By the time Mother died, it was the last first cousin, whose name was um, Pearl Richards. And she was um, living in Elkader, Iowa, a, a, a good three hours from where Mother was. In the morning, the morning that Mother died, I got in the car and drove up to tell Pearl the news. And this is a, um, an account of that visit. Pearl. Elkader, Iowa, a morning in March, the Turkey River running brown and wrinkly from a late spring snow in Minnesota. A white two-story house on Mulberry Street, windows flashing with sun, and I had come a hundred miles to tell our cousin Pearl that her childhood playmate, Vera, my mother, had died. I knocked and knocked at the door with its lace-covered oval of glass, and at last she came from the shadows and with one finger hooked the curtain aside peered into my face through her spectacles and held that pose, a grainy family photograph that could have been that of her mother. I called out, Pearl, it's Ted, it's Vera's boy. And my voice broke, for it came to me nearly 60, I was still my mother's boy, that boy for the rest of my life. Pearl at 90 was one year older than mother and a widow for 20 years. She wore a pale blue cardigan buttoned over a house dress, and she shook my hand in the tentative way of old women who rarely have hands to shake. When I told her that mother was gone, that she died the evening before, she said she was sorry that Vera wrote me a letter a while ago to say she wasn't good. We went to the kitchen and I sat at the table while she heated a pan of water and made us cups of instant coffee. She told me of a time when the two of them were girls and crawled out onto the porch roof to spy on my Aunt Mabel and a suitor who were swinging below. We got so excited we had to pee. <laughs> and we couldn't wait and peed right there on the roof. <laughs> and it trickled down over the edge and dripped in the bushes. But Mabel and that fella never heard. We took our cups into her living room where stripes from the drawn blinds draped over the world's fair satin pillows. She took the couch and I took a chair across from her. I've had some trouble with health myself, she said, taking off her glasses and wiping them. And I said she looked good though, and she said, I've started seeing people who aren't here. I know they're not real, but I see them the same. They come in the house and sit around and never say a word. They keep their heads down or cover their faces with cloths. I'm not afraid, but I don't know what they want of me. You won't be able to see, but one's right there on the staircase where the light falls through that window, a man in a light gray outfit. I turned to look at the landing where a patch of light fell over the carpeted steps. Sometimes I think my Max is with them. One seems to know his way around the house. What bothers me, Ted, is that they've started to write out lists of everything I own. They grow from room to room, three or four at a time, picking up things and putting them back. I've talked to Wilson, the chiropractor, and he just says that maybe it's time for me to go to the nursing home. <laughs> I asked her what her regular doctor said, and she said she didn't go there anymore, that he's not much good. But surely there's medicine, I said, and she said, maybe so. And then there was a pause that filled the room. After a while, we began to talk again of other things, and there were some stories we laughed a little over, and I wept a little, and then it was time for me to go to drive the long miles back, and she slowly walked me to the door and took my hand again, our warm, bony hands among the light hands of the shadows that reached to touch us but drew back. 
and I cleared my throat and said, I hoped she'd take care of herself and think about seeing a real medical doctor. And she said she'd give some thought to that. And I took my hand from hers and waved goodbye, and the door closed, and behind the lace the others stepped out of the stripes of light and resumed their inventory, touching the spoon I used and subtracting it from the sum of the spoons in the kitchen drawer. I think that's a, uh, that's a, uh, <clears throat> thank you. It's, it's not an uncommon thing. Uh, some of you have probably had experience with uh, older people beginning to see phantoms like that. And um, in this instance, they, it seems to me that they serve the purpose of having come to help her across to get her things ready to go herself. Uh, and. Um, I've talked to a, I talked to a friend of mine who's a therapist uh, about this, and he said that he knew of many of these situations, and that she's not psychotic because she still knows they're not real. Uh, but you know, th these things happen. This poem, this next poem about my father, begins rather inappropriately, but I save it at the um, as it goes along, so you can be prepared for that. Um, some of you have probably felt this way about aged parents. Father, today you would be 97 if you had lived, and we would all be miserable. <laughs> you and your children driving from clinic to clinic, an ancient fearful hypochondriac and his fretful son and daughter, asking directions, trying to read the complicated fading map of cures. But with your dignity intact, you have been gone for 20 years. And I am glad for all of us, although I miss you every day. The heartbeat under your necktie, the hand cupped on the back of my neck, old spice in the air, your voice delighted with stories. On this day each year, you love to relate that at the moment of your birth, your mother glanced out the window and saw lilacs in bloom. Well, today, lilacs are blooming in side yards all over Iowa, still welcoming you. And this is the last poem I'll read tonight. A self-portrait. Has some little towns out our direction. That was I. I was that older man you saw sitting in a confetti of yellow light and falling leaves on a bench at the empty horseshoe courts in Thayer, Nebraska, brown jacket, soft cap, wiping my glasses. I had noticed, of course, that the rows of sunken horseshoe pits were like old graves, but I was not letting my mind go there. Instead, I was looking with hope to a grapevine draped over a fence in a neighboring yard and knowing that I could hold on. Yes, that was I. And that was I, the round-shouldered man you saw that afternoon in Rising City as you drove past the abandoned mini-golf. Fists deep in my pockets, nose dripping, my cap pulled down against the wind as I walked the miniature main street, peering into the child-sized plywood store, the poor red school, the faded barn, thinking that not even in such an abbreviated world, with no more than its little events, the snap of a grasshopper's wing against a paper cup, could a person control this life? Yes, that was I. And that was I you spotted that evening just before dark in a weedy cemetery west of Staplehurst, down on one knee, as if trying to make out the name on a stone. Some lonely old man, you thought, come there to pity himself in the reliable sadness of grass among graves. But that was not so. Instead, I had found in its perfect web a handsome black and yellow spider pumping its legs to try to shake my footing as if I were a gift, an enormous moth that it could snare and eat. Yes, that was I. Thank you very much.
thank you. And uh, now the moment you've been waiting for, a <laughs> couple of lawyers to come sit down with Ted and, <laughs> and talk about poetry. Uh, my name's J.B. Milliken. I'm the president of the University of Nebraska. And uh, for the last six months, people have asked me repeatedly, what's it like being president? Are there any surprises? And usually the answer is no, there aren't very many surprises. But I got to tell you, there was nothing in the job description about sitting on a stage in front of thousands of people talking about poetry with the U.S. <laughs> Poet Laureate. So, Ted, that was wonderful. And I don't know if those of you in the audience in the front have looked around, but it is incredible to me that on a very snowy night in Lincoln, uh, the lead Center is almost filled with people to hear uh, Ted Kuzer read poetry. It's a wonderful <laughs> statement. At my uh, installation uh, 10 days ago or so, Ted read one of my favorite poems, which is, uh, So This is Nebraska. And it has a special meaning for me because it was given to me when I was an undergraduate on this campus by a good friend. So it's a great honor to be here uh, tonight, Ted, and have a chance to visit with you. One of the poems that you read um, tonight about your mother um, uh, said that you your mother taught you how to look at the world, to see life at play in everything. I'm curious about the influence of uh, people with whom we have relationships on art. And in your case, I'm interested in how your mother or other major influences in your life shape the way you look at things and how you express yourself. Well, I'm, um, both my parents, is my mic working OK? It's not. Okay, is that better? Um, my parents were, were wonderful people. That, um, to all appearances, very quite ordinary people. My father was a store manager, my mother was a homemaker. And, um, but they, my dad was a marvelous storyteller. I learned some of my love of stories from listening to dad. Um, uh, mother was a very, very quiet person, a very deep person, um, and she, she knew how to make a life out of very little. And I think in a way what I'm doing in that poem is commenting on how much pleasure she took in the ordinary world. Um, you know, she would, you know, a, a, a ripe apple to her was really something. You know, she, she would, you know, polish it up and look at it for a long time. And it was that sort of life that she perceived in that thing. And I think, I think they were an enormous influence on me. Um, we didn't have a lot of books in our house. Uh, we had a set of Alexander Dumas. We had uh, some novels, John Fox Jr.'s novels of the Ap Southern Appalachians and some things like that that I read as a kid. But they did belong to a group called Playmakers that, that every, every month they met at a different house and they would read plays aloud. And when they came to our house, I just loved that. I'd sit in the corner and listen to them read these plays. and. Uh, and that was another one of those early influences. So, yeah, and you know, I've never really, my dad's been gone for uh, 25 years and, and, and mother for six now, but you know, they're always with me. I, uh, I seem to be checking in on them all the time. And I think I talk a lot in my book, uh, uh, Poetry Home Repair Manual, about having imaginary readers. And my mother is probably my standard imaginary reader. She's the person to whom I direct poems. She had a couple of years of college, was, was interested in, in, in things, and, and that's the kind of reader I want. You know, it's not, not at all sophisticated literarily or anything like that. So it's a very long answer. So, <laughs> it, sa it saves Harvey and me from oh, having okay. to ask long yeah. questions. That, yeah. That's good, because we have very few questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. Uh, Ted, in, a, in addition to obviously the, the, your parents, uh, your life obviously is captured in your poetry in one way or the other. And the kind of the, the oddest thing about your background, perhaps, when you think about you as poet laureate, is the fact that you were an insurance executive for many years. Um, and, and did that, do you think that that experience influenced your writing? Um, 
Um, yes, it did. Uh, and you know, I, I think that what, what happened was that, um, well, there were in a number of ways, but I was working, uh, all of us, I think, are interested in, in uh, uh, finding communities that we belong to. And, uh, and, a, and a writer who uh, is, a, uh, is in the chair of rhetoric at Harvard uh, and is writing poems is writing them for an audience, a, a peer group that is different from a man like me who was working in a life insurance company among people every day who hadn't read poems since they were in the eighth grade. And I, I, would, uh, I would show my poems to my secretary at Lincoln Benefit Life, and if she didn't understand them, I would take them home and work on them and that sort of thing. So it, my, my rather open style, I think, is a result of having worked for years and years with people like that who were not literary people. Um, and uh, I, I'm very fond of them all. Um, and wrote a few poems about the office, but not many while I was there. Ted, I want to come back to the um, question of influences on, on art. Um, I'm reading right now Frank McCourt's uh, early biography, Angela's Ashes, and he says that his childhood was, of course, miserable, and that a happy childhood is hardly worth your while. Now, <laughs> Your childhood doesn't strike me as miserable, a little no. Spartan maybe, but certainly not miserable. But is suffering necessary to good art? Maybe just to the Irish, you know. <laughs> that's, that's possible. Uh, I don't, I, I've never bought into that. We have this romantic idea of the suffering artist and so on. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier in my reading uh, my friend Keith Jacobs Hagen, who's a marvelous painter, a uh, nationally renowned painter. Um, I don't think Keith would mind me saying that I, I think Keith had a blissfully happy childhood. His parents doted on him, my parents doted on me, and I've you know, been able to write. So it isn't a prerequisite you know, at all. That's a good message for a lot of parents yeah. and children out there. Yeah. And, we, and we've been beating our kids for years <laughs> trying to get them to be artists. <laughs> your, your role as, as poet laureate is obviously, in part at least, to advance the cause of poetry. And I, I guess this is as good a threesome to ask this question. What would you tell two young men anxious to be lawyers as to why they should care about poetry? Well, I think, I, I think you could do it by showing them poems that might mean something to them. I, it really has to be done by example, I think. Uh, uh, the, so many people have been turned off from poetry by um, public school educations where poems had to be uh, treated as if they were algebraic problems. They had one answer. The teacher was the only one who knew the answer, um, and if you didn't get it right, you failed the course, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so, but in order to bring people back in, I think we have, there are ways of just showing them poems that are, you know, that are open and generous and um, inviting and, and say, you know, this is what poetry has to offer. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to do that. I have a newspaper column that's going to be starting up in about I, just several weeks now that is going to be distributed free to any newspaper that wants to use it, in which I'll, I'll pick a poem by someone, that's a short poem that most newspaper readers could understand and introduce it and try to kind of nudge people in, back into poetry a little bit by saying, well, this, you know, if you like this poem, maybe you'd like others like this and so on. So, uh, but example, I think, is really the way to do it, saying, you know, here's a poem. I, I talked a lot early in my tenure as Poet Laureate about um, uh, looking at the world in fresh new ways. And I, I used to use an example. Uh, there's a poet out in Colorado, a friend of mine, Joe Hutchison. And uh, he has a one-line poem about an artichoke, which goes, O oh, heart weighed down by so many wings. You know, that's the artichoke. <laughs> And, and there's something about that, that once you get that in your head, you can never go through the produce department again without thinking of that, you know, seeing those little hearts with those wings. And that's the kind of thing that poetry can contribute, you know, can, it can lift life a little bit like that. Yeah. Ted, I want to 
talk a little bit about how your fame and fortune has altered your life. You wrote a, uh, you wrote a book of poems, uh, published a book of poems with Jim Harrison called Braided Creek, where none of the poems are attributed to either of you. And there's a poem in the book, I think, that uh, addresses this point about this laboring too hard sometimes for fame or in the, on the book jacket, one of you, again, not attributed, uh, was asked about uh, the source of the poems, uh, and either you or Jim said, everyone gets tired of this continuing cult of the personality. This book is an assertion in favor of poetry and against credentials. Um, so now, I don't know whether you said that or whether Jim Harrison said that, but uh, assuming you shared it, I'm wondering how you cope now with that outlook, uh, being the nation's premier poet uh, and everything that goes with that. Well, one thing that I, I you know, there are a lot of things that I have, I've been thinking about. Um, I can't send out my own poems now uh, to magazines because the worst of them would get published. Um, <laughs> and so I've stopped that altogether. And I, I've been thinking about using it, sending them out under a pseudonym so that they'd be treated fairly, you know. Um, that's one of the things. Um, uh, I, am, I, may, I am quite concerned about the way that we attach poetry to poets. Um, there are a lot of well-known poets in this country who are marvelous deliverers of their poems on, on stages and so on. And I wonder if once the person is gone from this world, if the poems will hold up without them there to do the delivery. And, you know, I believe, and I, I grew up with poems that I found in books and read them and loved them, and um, I still think that that's where poems are, are at their best, or, uh, is on a page, a private communication between the poet and a reader in a, in a very quiet situation. And it, it concerns me that, that, that we put, we're putting so much emphasis on poets and not so much on what they're what they're actually doing. Um, poetry readings are a lot of fun, and you know there's some huge ones going on now. The the um, at the Dodge Poetry Festival in uh, New Jersey, they have uh, a tent that holds 3,500 people, and they fill it, you know, with people coming to readings and so on. But I don't know. It's uh, celebrity is not particularly good for the arts. I don't think. I stuck with it for a little while. <laughs> You, uh, you mentioned that, that uh, Carl Shapiro had an, an influence on you, and I wonder if you could talk about that, but also in the context, does that translate into the kind of influence you think you have on, on your students? Or how, how do you think about the teaching role uh, in terms of trying to influence people that for, an, for a uh, work that really requires talent? Well, you know, we have, a, we have a really good program here. Um, some of my colleagues in the creative writing unit are here tonight. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's true that if I work with a group of poets for a semester, I may they may tend to start writing like I write. But then they go and they write with Hilda Raz or Grace Bauer. Um, and write in a different way. And I, I don't know any way around that, really. I think that's OK that it happens that way, that we, you know. All art is, earned, is learned uh, through imitation. And, uh, and all of us, I began my writing career by imitating other writers. And uh, that's the way it works. Painters do the same thing. Um, um, I like my personal preferred way of teaching is to do it tutorially. I have my class, I meet my students one on one for an hour a week. Um, and that, that way I can deal with each one, each one's idiosyncrasies in a, in a different way, you know, and so on. So I really enjoy that. Um, but um, there's a certain amount of teaching you can accomplish, I think. There are things that really can't quite be taught, you know, and that's metaphor and association, that sort of thing. If a person is not gifted with the ability to make metaphors, it's very difficult to show them how to do it. Um, uh, at least I've never been able to figure it out, and so on. 
That's a kind of not a very good answer to your question, but. Ted, um, I like your approach of writing for an ordinary reader because then I find that your poetry is accessible to me. And, uh, um, but you are well-educated, well-read, and presumably not an ordinary reader yourself. I'm curious about those writers that you like to read that the ordinary readers for whom you write might not appreciate. Well, there are poets whose difficulties are things that I can handle that I think ordinary readers might not be able to. Um, they're not my favorite poets, you know. Um, most of my reading is not in poetry. My, my leisure reading is, you know, I read, I read novels and short stories and books of essays and so on. My favorite reading is personal essays. Um, I love books of personal essays. And Local Wonders, that book of mine from Nebraska, is sort of that kind of a book. Um, the personal essay seems to me to be the most natural way of communicating in words. Uh, the, it's what we do in conversation. We tell somebody how to do something or we ask them, you know, we raise questions and so on. It's just like you've just moved a conversation over into, onto the page in a way. It's very comfortable. Um, but sure, you know, I read, I read people that I would not try to push on an audience of unsophisticated readers. Um, because I'm interested in what these people are doing, of course, and, uh, and as a teacher, I think I need to know about it, what they're doing, too. You're the uh, first poet laureate from the Midwest, and you fly to Washington and meet with all the, I assume, East Coast and West Coast literati. Uh, you want to tell us something about that as an experience? Well, it's... Um, it's pretty heady stuff. I, um, <laughs> I was in the Library of Congress uh, in December, and, or November, and um, there's an area there called the Kluge Center for Scholars, and um, scholars have carols there. They're noted scholars who are working there, and I was walking down the hall, and my, uh, my contact at the library said, here are a couple people I'd like to have you meet, and it was... Uh, John Hope Franklin, the great black historian, um, and John Carter, who was the attorney who took the Brown versus Board of Education to the Supreme Court. These guys are just there, you know. Um, <laughs> Kathy and I went to a concert in December, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was sitting right behind us, you know, and Senator Levin is over here, and we're trying to act like we're not from Nebraska, you know. <laughs> But it's a, the Library of Congress is, for, for those of you who have never been to the Library of Congress, you need to see it. It's probably the most beautiful building I've ever been in. It is, every, every, every little facet of it is in some way enhanced with art or sculpture or that sort of thing. It's really, it's really quite marvelous. And uh, so I'm really enjoying that part of it a great deal. And I like Washington. Washington's easy to find your way around in. Although, the first time I drove there, they have turnarounds in Washington, like these, like we have here in Lincoln now. Um, I, I drove in right at, I came in from South Carolina, um, and I drove into the south, uh, up across the, across the bridge into Washington. I got on one of those turnarounds, and I went around probably eight or nine times <laughs> in rush hour traffic, you know, with everyone honking at me saying, who is this geezer with these Nebraska plates, you know, until I finally just wrenched my way out and, you know, so there, it, it's been rather trying, too, at times, yeah. yeah. Ted, I used to uh, get Christmas cards from another Nebraska poet, Bob Carey. His poems were not as accessible uh, to me as, <laughs> as yours. Um, and, but I've read about your friendship uh, with Bob, mm -hmm. first uh, from him and, and uh, more recently uh, from you. Was it poetry that brought the two of you together? Well, you know, it, in a sense it was. I mentioned uh, Tom McCowan in that, as I opened tonight, the, the guy who was reading to the little six-year-old boy. Tom was a student, and he was a friend of Bob's, and he introduced me to Bob. And Bob was, you know, this is long before he ran for governor, wasn't even involved in politics at all at that time. But he, he was interested in writing, and he, you know, they, Tom hooked him up with me because Bob was interested in doing some writing. And that's how we got to be friends. And uh, 
and have most of our friendship has been sort of surrounding, you know, has uh, sur surrounded books and so on, and reading. And I don't see much of him anymore, but uh, you know, I hear from him, you know, several times a year. Well, now that he's a university president, he's really busy. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, I, I think we could easily continue this conversation for hours, but. Uh, it is getting late and there's snow outside. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for participating in, with a couple of lawyers. Um, for those of you who are interested in hearing Ted in another venue, NET Television is hosting an event in Kearney on April 16th at 7 p.m. at UNK's Recital Hall. Uh, Ted and Nebraska Poet Laureate Will William Kleffelkorn and several emerging Nebraska poets will participate in a taping for a future NET program. That event is also sponsored by the Nebraska Center for the Book and the Nebraska Arts Council. Finally, all of you are invited to a reception in the orchestra lobby where Ted will be signing books. The University Bookstore has some of Ted's books for sale and the Friends of the University Press is raising funds for the press by selling a special signed edition of one of Ted's essays. These are available for purchase in the ticket holders lobby just inside the lead main entrance. So thank all of you for coming and thank you Ted for being here tonight and sharing your yeah. talent.